Okay. All right. Uh, Cameron English is uh, our guest speaker today. Um, Cameron actually recently appeared on an episode of the Dr. Phil show talking about um, fat shaming. And uh, he just wrote his second piece for a second uh, UK think tank. Um, so he's becoming pretty popular out there in uh, across the pond, as they say. Uh, so I will go ahead and turn this over to Cameron. Go ahead, Cameron. All right. Thank you, Tom. It's nice to see all of you again. It's been a little while. Hope everybody's been well. So today I wanted to talk about uh, processed food. And more specifically, I want to talk about uh, the supposed dangers that come along with processed food, and particularly with uh, ultra processed food, as it's you know pejoratively known in the media these days. Um, I think this is this is largely overblown the way this information is presented to the public, and I want to start actually with a film recommendation. About a decade ago, a filmmaker named Tom Naughton made a documentary called Fathead, and he, he shot it in response to Morgan Spur, uh, Morgan Spurlock's film Super Size Me. So the the idea was he's going to go on a fast food diet for thirty days, and he's going to follow the same rules. So he's going to eat two thousand calories a day. He's uh, going to eat everything on the menu at least once. But he had a third rule that Spurlock did, and he said, I have a functioning brain, so I am going to be a little more judicious about the choices that I make. And at the end of this experiment, I predict I will have lost weight and improved my health. So I, I highly recommend you watch the film, but I am going to spoil the conclusion. At the, at the end of this experiment, it was 28 days. He had lost 12 pounds. He had reduced his body fat. And his, he's in his doctor's office and his doctor is just dumbfounded. And he says, I don't like what you're proving here. And uh, his, do his, his doctor says, you know, I think you've proved your point that it's not just avoid fast food. And there's a little more to nutrition than, than that. And then Tom, at the, at the very end of the film, he says, you know, the other thing I wanted to stress is that if fast food is addictive, it's a really bad addiction because after a month of eating it, I didn't eat it for six months. I just couldn't no. stand the sight of a McDonald's. <laughs> so <laughs> so my, my point in bringing this up is to say, um, you know, the way we talk about processed food, it's 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 largely nonsense. It's driven more by ideology well, um, than it is actually, by science. I and uh, I want to um, I want so to address a handful of specific no points. Uh, hey, hey, Tom, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you mute yourself? Because there's a lot of background. One second. One second. One second. One second. What was that? Cameron, can you mute yourself? There's a lot of background. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay, so I want to deal with with a handful of critical issues. These are these are constantly in the media. They're constantly in the peer reviewed uh, literature as well. So, first and foremost, uh, processed food isn't necessarily harmful. And in fact, I think when you look carefully at the science, what you see is that processing is a very poor metric for nutrition. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this idea that processed food is addictive. Um, I, I think that's just an, an awful hypothesis that's not been substantiated. Uh, and then I want to talk about the fact there's a, there's a a lot of unprocessed foods that are you know if they're overconsumed they're unhealthy and even potentially dangerous in some cases. And then I'm going to wrap up with a brief discussion of food snobbery because I think this is really what this whole campaign is rooted in. It's not rooted in science. It's rooted in these sort of ideological presuppositions. So let's let's take these in turn, starting with the idea that that processed food is is uniquely harmful. So, before we get into it, I want to want to give a definition of processed food just so we're we're clear on the terms we're using. So, this is from um, a very well known chef and a science writer. His name is Anthony Warner. He blogs under the name uh, The Angry Chef, and I really love his work because he's very critical of Michael Pollan and some of these other pop food writers and these weird ideas that they propagate. It's very thoughtful, very science-based commentary. So he says, processed foods are broadly defined as any food that has undergone a process to alter its flavor, composition, or shelf life. Now, my commentary is that's just about everything, right? Unless you're going out into the woods and picking berries off a bush and hunting a deer and eating it right there on the spot, you're, you're eating processed food. Now, the, the system that's most commonly used to, to rate the processing of different foods. It's called the NOVA classification system. Some of you are probably familiar with this, but there's four basic categories. There's unprocessed and minimally processed foods. 
There's uh, processed culinary ingredients. So this would be like noodles and butter, these types of items. Um, and then there's processed foods. And then the, the granddaddy, the double plus super bad is uh, ultra processed foods. Now, this, this classification system seems to make sense in the abstract, right? The more uh, modification that you make to a particular ingredient or a particular item, the more processed it is. The problem is nobody actually agrees on which foods count as processed. So uh, I have in mind here a 2021 study, they looked at 470 publications and they found that all of these articles, these are journal articles and media articles, they had 146 different definitions of processed foods. You know, so even when they're working from the same sort of a scale, right, the more processing, the, you know, the more processed the food is, that kind of thing, they don't agree on it. And so the important point is, if, if you can't give me some sort of a semi-objective standard of what processing is, then you really can't use it as a metric for nutrition. So here's the conclusion from the authors of this 2021 paper. They say, from the perspective of food science and technology, Processing and nutritional value do not have a linear relationship, and these concepts need to be disassociated. It's perfectly said, I think that's about as clear as I've seen writing in an academic journal before, um, but it's, it's absolutely the case. And let me give you just a couple of examples. So according to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, um, deli meat, granola, and crackers are heavily processed. Now, if you look at the, these foods in terms of the nutritional content, there's nothing harmful about these. You know, if you think about, say, two ounces of turkey or salami or something, right? This is, this is the foundation for lunch. You know, it's, it's got a good, good balance of uh, fat and protein. Uh, there's not very much sugar in it. And, uh, you know, there's a healthy amount of micronutrients that you need in these foods. Uh, same thing with, with granola and crackers, right? You have more carbohydrate, less fat, a little bit less protein perfectly acceptable for breakfast or, you know, you know, eight, eight Ritz crackers with an ounce of cheese or something totally fine as a snack, right? These are perfectly acceptable foods to be part of a balanced diet. Um, but when you look at the flip side and you look at some of the, you know, quote unquote unprocessed foods, um, you see things that can be um, potentially, potentially unhealthy if you over consume them. So these are all based on the Nova system. So under unprocessed and minimally processed foods, they have dried fruit, nuts, fruit juice with no added sugar. Um, and then in the next category, processed culinary ingredients, they have honey extracted from honeycomb, molasses uh, from cane or beets. So if you think about any of these, especially the sweeteners, it's very easy to overconsume these. And there's been, there's been research done on these. And what they show is that if people eat too much uh, uh, beet sugar or too much molasses or too much maple syrup or whatever, you know, as natural as these are, they will increase your risk for diabetes. They will probably make you fat. Um, they'll increase your risk for metabolic syndrome. So all of the harms are still there, whether or not the food is processed or not. And uh, the same thing for like, you know, dried fruit or nuts. These are great snacks. I have no problem with them. But my wife, sometimes she'll buy uh, dried fruit I just can't touch it because it's delicious and I can overeat it without even thinking about it. So it, it all I'm saying, and I'm gonna use uh, moderation over and over again. I'm just gonna warn you in advance, right? All of this stuff, if you overeat it, can do damage to you, metabolically speaking. So you just have to be a little self-aware and a little thoughtful about what you're eating. This processing scale, it's not gonna do much for you in terms of trying to uh, maintain a healthy weight or eat a, eat a balanced diet. Now, a lot of people will come back. Actually, let me give you one more example. I'm sorry. And I'm going to share my screen here because I want to talk about milk. Um, uh, typical milk that you find at the grocery store, it's not considered a heavily processed food. When you think about the steps that it has to go through, um, it's quite heavily processed. So let me just show you this graph here. You guys see this? It's a little flow chart. You should be able to see that. Yes, we do. Okay. So depending on the milk product, these are the various stages of processing that they have to, that the different items have to go through. So from the time it leaves the cow to the time it gets to your grocery store, these are, these are all the things. And this comes from a, a 2019 paper um, on, on what the modern dairy industry looks like. So <clears throat> you can see from this sort of an overview, but um, of course, you have pasteurization, homogenization, 
Um, the whole time this process is going, you have to have uh, a maintained temperature, right? You can't let it get too hot. Um, and then of course, for that, you need refrigeration. Of course, you have automated milking operations now. You have um, veterinary care for the animals. You have all sorts of quality control testing going on. Um, now you're not adding anything to the product, strictly speaking in these cases, but just to get milk from a dairy to you, there's a tremendous amount of processing involved, right? And of course, this is a good thing. This doesn't make the product itself uh, better or worse for you. And in fact, the American Academy of Pediatrics, as again, as I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, they recommend giving children ages one year and older milk, right? It's supposed to be a primary part of their diet. The fact that it's gone through all of these stages actually makes it safer. Now, in contrast, uh, the AAP says, don't give your kids raw milk. <laughs> you know, because you can make them very sick. And in rare cases, people have died from consuming raw milk because there's all kinds of microbes in it. There's, there's much less quality control. So it can be very, very dangerous. So again, this just underscores the fact that processing serves a very important role. You could make the same, um, same argument for canning and various processes that are made to meant to preserve food. So it stays on the shelf and uh, doesn't make people sick. Now, the, the, the opponents of processed food, they'll come back inevitably at this argument and they'll say, well, obviously we have no problem with milk and we have no problem with almonds, right? What we're really concerned about is, is the double plus bad ultra processed food. You know, these are, these are things that, um, these are largely industrial products. They'll say they have four or five added ingredients. Um, they have this perfect mixture, mixture of sugar, salt, and fat. So it hits that bliss point. So people get this massive dopamine hit and they just keep coming back and they can't stop eating potato chips because they're addictive. And this is what we're really upset about. Uh, I have so many problems with this argument. I, I really don't know where to start, but let's, let's begin here. We don't use this standard for any other product or service. You know? So uh, I, as I mentioned in a previous one of these, I bought a Toyota last year. And the primary reason we bought it is because it's got a great crash test rating and I have a young son who I need to transport. It's got um, plenty of leg room, it's got storage room, it's got a great sound system, it's got it's climate control. It's all the features that, that um, a young family would want. Now, no one says, you know, those bastards at Toyota, they're making cars that the driving public wants to buy. These are perfectly engineered automobiles and that's over the line. I think everybody rightly understands that that's foolish, you know. Of course, companies make products that their, their customers want. Um, you can think same thing with music, same thing with movies, same thing with cell phones, right? The features continually improve until they reach a point where the consumer is happy and they will keep buying the product. It's the same thing with, with food, food, right? Most, most food products fail. So the ones that end up on your shelves are the ones that stay there because people will buy them. There's nothing conspiratorial about this. There's nothing malevolent about it. It's that these companies are trying to figure out which products consumers will buy. It's as simple as that. So there's nothing scandalous about that, I, I would stress. But if you look at um, just some of the evidence ar around these foods, and, and this will probably get me in trouble when this goes up on YouTube, I really don't care. There's nothing wrong with um, having a Pop-Tart every once in a while or having a bag of chips or you know eating, eating this, this food. I think we all inherently recognize that you know, McDonald's French fries shouldn't be the foundation of your diet. That's right. That's not what I'm here to argue. Nonetheless, if you're getting around the table with your family or your friends and you're eating maybe too much or you're eating certain foods that you know are not good to eat routinely, that's okay, right? There's social bonding going on. There's a lot of benefit in that. And the fact that you're eating food that's more pleasurable than it is nutritious, it's okay, right? For, for an occasional event, not a big deal. Um, and, and here's another thing. I'm sure you guys remember the Twinkie diet from uh, 2010. We had this uh, professor of nutrition at Kansas State. His name was Mark Halb. And he went on the Twinkie diet, as the media called it. So he was eating cupcakes and cookies and Twinkies and candy, all, things that most people would say, this is junk food. Um, and he lost 27 pounds on this diet because he limited his intake to 1,800 calories and his point was to say, we just have to be judicious about how much you eat. That's really all it comes down to. Now, a lot of his critics came out and they said, well, you've taken funding from Coca-Cola, so we don't trust your results. 
And he said, well, what is there not to trust? This is what I weighed before. This is what I weigh now. Here's my food log, you know? So he reversed the experiment and he ate a balanced diet that was built around salads, but he ate as much as he wanted and he gained 17 pounds. <laughs> so this, I think what this clearly illustrates is that there's no magic food. There's no particularly demonic or evil food. It just takes a little bit of moderation. And there's that word. It's a very unsexy word. No one likes to hear that. I think Aristotle was right 2,300 years ago. <laughs> Moderation is all it takes. Um, now, the, the, the food addiction folks will come back and they'll say, well, we have these animal models and, and they show that rats become addicted to sugary uh, chow. You know, right? And when we give them chow that has this, mat, this mix of salt and sugar and fat, they get addicted to it. So this, this lends support to the food addiction hypothesis. Now, what they typically won't stress is that these are very artificial conditions and they give the, the, the animals restricted access to this chow. And then when they eat it, they will. there's some sort of penalty involved. So they'll shock the rodents on their feet if they eat this stuff. And for whatever reason, this encourages them to eat more. So there's a couple of, couple of things to say here. When you do these same experiments and you give them unrestricted access to this food, they lose interest in it which I think is very, very striking. You know, I don't know how that would translate to a human situation, but my suspicion is that when people have access to stuff and they're not told, don't eat this, it's bad for you. And we're going to tax this and we're going to, right. We're going to tell you how to live. It's time to eat bugs instead of meat and all of the silliness that's in the news lately. Um, it, it loses that sort of like, this is the, the naughty thing. This is the forbidden fruit. I think that might be part of, part of the situation. But in any case, in these animal models, when you give them unrestricted access, when you don't, you know, tase them for eating eating sugar, they lose interest in it. Um, and then you also have on the human side, you have interesting research. Um, there's there's been some studies done that show people develop uh, odd habit, odd eating habits, and I don't want to say addiction. I think that's the wrong word, um, but they habitually eat things that are not. Um, good, right? They're not delicious. They're not nutritious. They're not hyper palatable. They're not processed. Um, so for example, there's a show some years ago called Freaky Eaters. And one of the women on this show ate nothing but cornstarch. Cornstarch. She would go to the grocery store, get a bag of cornstarch and just eat it by the spoonful, right? Now, I get. I mean, I guess you could call cornstarch a processed food, I suppose, but it's not good, right? There's not an epidemic of people eating cornstarch. But nonetheless, the point is, is that people develop these odd eating habits and it has nothing to do with the palatability of the food necessarily. Um, and then you also have studies where uh, researchers will take obese patients, they'll give them a drug like naltrexone, and you can significantly decrease their interest in, in hyper palatable foods, but they don't lose weight. And the reason is they just shift their eating habits to other stuff. You know, maybe they go to lots of unprocessed food, but they're still overeating. Okay. And we can, we can talk a lot more about this, but I think these are the sort of data points that for one thing you don't hear about in the media very often, but they really complicate the food addiction hypothesis. You know, I, I, I guess you could say, well, these are exceptions to the rule, but I think they're too common for that to be the case. I think they go right to the heart of this hypothesis. Um, and that's a real problem. So I've, I've stressed some of this in my writing. I think it's important. So let me just briefly recap. I've thrown a bunch of information at you. I've thrown a bunch of references at you. And if you want to look at any of the research I'm citing, I'm happy to uh, send that to you after the fact. But what we've seen here, processed food is not by default harmful. I think that's a, an assumption that's not justified. Um, I think that the you know, ultra processed foods are addictive. I don't think that's justified by the data. And of course, there's lots of unprocessed, non-GMO, organic, all natural stuff that is just as bad for you as anything that they tell you is harmful in terms of processed food. So as I mentioned at the top, I think food snobbery is really what's driving this, this whole uh, campaign. And here I'm pulling from a University of Michigan food scholar. Her name is S. Margo Finn. She wrote a great essay for the Breakthrough Institute in 2019. It's called so uh, Food Injustice. I don't agree with everything in there. I think there's some of her progressive politics leached into that. But I think on this point, she's 100% she's correct. So she points out that um, <clears throat> beginning in the 1980s, you had more people entering the middle class 
and the upper class. And so they have disposable income and they start spending it on all sorts of different things, including their food. And then at the same time, you have the industrialized food system, as it, again, as it's pejoratively called, really exploding in terms of efficiency and productivity. So you have, uh, following the Green Revolution in the middle of the 20th century, you have higher yielding crop varieties, you have um, increase in the use of synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. So crop yields are increasing. Um, on, on the animal agriculture side, you have improvements in veterinary care, you have improved animal breeds um, that produce more meat and milk per animal. Um, and then you have the technological improvements that keep the animals healthier, and so they produce more. So all of this contributes to widespread access to food at a lower price. And so um, if you're wealthy, food didn't just, it's no longer about sustaining yourself, it's about an identity. And so here's what Finn writes about this. She says, middle and upper class people began to fixate on gourmet food, weight loss dieting, natural foods, and ethnic cuisines. Most of the shift in attitudes toward food was undertaken in the name of health and in the environment, but its primary function has been to enable people of a certain social class to distinguish themselves from the unwashed masses. <laughs> now she, she gives several examples of this. She, she gives the example of Beto O'Rourke doing his presidential campaign a few years ago. Um, he was asked by a reporter, how do we tackle uh, obesity and hunger? You know, these are you know, paradoxical issues and they're, they're constantly threatening a lot of Americans. And his answer was, well, we need to subsidize farm to table restaurants. And Finn says to this, she says, well, this is ridiculous. This is the answer of someone who lives in a bubble who's disconnected from these problems, right? So she says, obviously the reality is you need widespread access to nutritious food, but then you also just have to accept that people are not necessarily gonna eat the way you want them to eat, right? Even if you're well-meaning, even if you're trying to get them to eat more all, all natural, you know, all this stuff, whatever, they may not do it and you have to be okay with that. And I think that's what a lot of this comes down to. And let me give you two more quotes and then I'll, I'll stop talking <laughs> and then we can uh, have a discussion. Um, this, this first one is from Ashley Gerhardt. She's an associate professor of psychology at the University of Michigan. If you look at the food addiction literature, her name pops up very frequently. She's done a lot of work on this, but she says, it will likely take industry regulation to chip away at the popularity of ultra processed foods and the health problems that come with them. And then one more, this is from uh, Richard Hoffman. He's an associate lecturer in nutritional biochemistry at the University of Hertfordshire. And he says, simply reducing your intake of ultra processed foods may be a challenge. Ultra processed foods are designed to be hyper palatable and together with persuasive marketing, this can make resisting them an enormous challenge for some people. So as I alluded to earlier, I, I can't stand this mindset that's so prevalent among uh, a lot of academics these days, particularly in public health and obesity research and tobacco control, these people just sort of take it upon themselves to say, stupid Rube, you don't have any self-control. I'm gonna step in and make decisions for you. I'm gonna tax the food that you wanna eat. I'm gonna redesign your built environment so you have to walk more. And I'm gonna make sure there's more water fountains and I'm gonna tax soda and I'm gonna take vending machines at your kids' schools. Now, as, as we were talking about just before we started recording, none of this has worked, of course. And what they're saying is, well, we just need more of it. We need to double down more, <laughs> right? But it's, it's, it's two things, right? It's this sort of condescending attitude. I think it's the sort of technocratic tinkering that F.A. Hayek really attacked in a lot of his work. You know, these people, they don't have and they can't possibly have the knowledge they need to plan everybody's diet, but they're so hubristic that they do it anyway. So that drives me bananas. But then of course the evidence is not on their side. There is not good evidence behind any of these ideas, but they persist. So I, th I think ultimately the problem is um, something that the physicist Freeman Dyson pointed out in his book, The Scientist is Rebel. If you haven't read it, highly recommend it. But he says early on in the book that uh, science is a mosaic of partial and conflicting visions. But there is one common element in these visions the common element is rebellion against the restrictions imposed by the locally prevailing culture. So I think in a lot of uh, scientific and public health issues, a lot of researchers have lost sight of this. You know, They become apologists for the status quo or they become you know, the, like the intellectual muscle behind certain popular ideas in public policy. 
And what they should be doing is they should be stress testing these ideas, you know. So even if something is mainstream and it is valid and it should be embraced, I think it's the job of scientists to say, okay, does the evidence really support this? Do we really need to hold on to this idea? That's what science does. And that's when society flourishes is because you have sort of a check on the politicians and on the broader culture that sometimes does things that are uh, silly, right? You need a rigorous check on these things. And I think as the food addiction and the processed food stuff shows, you have a lot of academics who are just not fulfilling that role. And so you get these, you know, food is addicting, uh, climate change causes heart attacks, uh, men can get pregnant, you know, all of these silly ideas that a lot of people take seriously today that, that obviously don't stand up to scrutiny. So ultimately that's the issue we're facing. I'll stop there. Thank you all so much for your time. And then if you have questions, I'm happy to talk. Okay, roll it out to you guys. <clears throat> Any questions? Yes. Thank you, Cameron. I, I, I agree with nearly everything you say, not quite all, but, but still, we, we do have the problem of obesity. So what's your solution to that? You know, if I, if I had a solution to that, I don't think I'd be talking to you guys. I'd, I'd live in a mansion somewhere. Right? I, would have, I, would have, I would have produced the pill that, that treats it. Um, I, I don't know that there is a good one. I think the mistake we've made is trying to treat it as a policy issue. Um, I, it, in my experience, because I was obese as a kid, um, what worked for me was um, support from my family. And it was good nutrition advice from sources I trusted. And uh, I think you have to tackle it on that level, you know. So when the CDC comes out and they says, and they say, you know, we're going to combat, uh, you know, food injustice, and we're going to we're going to combat food deserts, you know, it's like these are these broad policy responses that really can't do anything because what you have to get at is why do people eat these foods? Why do they make the choices they make? And I just don't think that can be solved. So. I, I, I honestly don't think I have a good answer. I think there, there are some drugs that are coming onto the market that are, that are supposed to help with weight loss. Um, I think those might make a dent in it, but I think there isn't a, a perfect solution to obesity. Okay, can I have one more question? Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. And I agree, I, I agree with you. I don't think there's such a thing as food addiction, but clearly there's alcohol addiction and tobacco addiction. And I think I looked into the um, relationship between taxation and alcohol use over the last 250 years. And I think that to me, there's a very clear relationship between the amount of alcohol that's drunk and the amount of tax. Starting in the 17th century when you could buy a pint of gin for a penny or something, and mm. thousands of people were getting um, drunk and becoming alcoholics, and they put a tax on it, and it reduced it greatly. And I, I think that's continued since. So, do you think the same thing might work with obesity and, and certain I, foods? Or? No, I don't. I, 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 I don't because I don't think there's a, um, I don't think there's a specific food. And as you say, the foods that people are eating are the not tastiest of them. Mm. And, 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 and in general, are pretty nutritious. I mean, I think it's eating too much of the wrong things that's, or eating too much of them rather than eating them at all is the problem. Sure. The other problem with that is that you're punishing those people who are consuming the products moderately um, while you're trying to go after the people that are supposedly abusing the products. Yeah, that's yeah. in a way what I'm saying too. Good point. I have a question and a comment. Uh, first of all, did you define ultra processing or did you say it's indefinable? Uh, I gave the definition that they use, and I, I think my point was that it's not definable as a measure of nutritional quality. Um, but I think, and I can I can bring up the exact Nova classification if you want specifically what they uh, what they call it here. If you give me just a second. 
So yeah. I believe it's Are if impossible it's, foods ultra processed. That's another good question. Yeah, good question. Absolutely, I would say. Okay. Uh, okay. That question comes from my friend Alice here listening in. She's my foodie you friend. Should, and now yeah. the fattest. <laughs> you should okay. see the processes um, that Impossible has to go through to create the products. Exactly. Okay, so here's just here's the specific definition. So ultra processed foods are industrial industrial formulations made entirely or mostly from substances extracted from food, oils, fats, sugar, starch, proteins, uh, derived from food constituents, so hydrogenated fats, modified starch, synthesized in lab laboratories, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so my, my take on this is that, you know, these are, right, you don't find Twinkies on a tree. Obviously not, but I think this all sort of misses the point because this is all stuff that your body recognizes and um, you can metabolize. And again, as Nigel was saying, it's it's overconsumption. That's the problem, right? So they, they have a definition here, but I just don't think it makes sense. And let, let me give you a couple of... Yeah. Okay. Now I want to comment about the Twinkie diet. You cited yeah. a guy at uh, Kansas State. I'd love to look up his academic heritage and see if he was uh, trained by our Paul Saltman. Paul Saltman, distinguished biochemist here at UC San Diego. He came to us from USC. He had a lot of expertise in other areas, but he taught a very popular course called the Biochemistry of Nutrition. And he taught it not only for chem majors, but also for uh, non-science majors. And he used the Twinkie as his subject. And of course, his bottom line was a Twinkie, there's no such thing as junk food. The Twinkie, when you boil it all down, is protein, fat, and carbohydrate. And in the lab, they would do that. They would process the Twinkie. He said, try to find me some poisonous substances. And of course, they couldn't even... <laughs> To, they couldn't even pick up the minute amounts of preservative in the Twinkie. Well, he was rewarded by his graduate students one year because somebody went out and uh, bronzed a, a Twinkie and it <laughs> sat prominently on his desk, a bronze Twinkie. Now, don't think that Paul had a long-term impact because the largest Whole Foods in our area is immediately adjacent to the UC San Diego campus. I don't need to tell any of you that our scientific record here is uh, <laughs> incomparable, but yet if you wanna see a lot of colleagues and a lot of graduate students, go in the Whole Foods store. They love that store. They give it a lot of business. Yeah. I give it as little business as I possibly can. <laughs> yeah, I think the Very feeling is mutual. Um, what, let me make one comment before we go on. I, I'm sure you guys remember Walter Kempner at Duke University. Um, if not, he he had this rice diet that he would put people on where, right? They were taking in like 250 to 300 grams of rice. They were drinking fruit juice. They were drinking or consuming uh, just granulated white sugar. Um, they weren't allowed any vegetables. <laughs> they weren't allowed any meat. Um, and people lost an absurd amount of weight. I mean, he, he had multiple, probably hundreds of people lose more than 100 pounds. Now, if you ask any dietitian today, any nutritionist, any, any food uh, writer, you know, they would all say, this is preposterous. You can't, you can't eat like this. And they did, absolutely, right? Because it came down to um, caloric intake, but then also um, like the actual process of eating. You know, rice is very filling. It's bulking. <laughs> so people lost weight on this. And I think Looking at that, that really sort of redirected my thinking. You know, I said, oh, okay, this makes sense. You know, this good food, bad food, eat this, not that sort of sort of charade is just that. What about Michael Pollan? Oh, Pollan. I didn't uh, know that. About Michael Pollan. <laughs> yeah, I um I don't I don't know. I want to be I want to be polite here. <laughs> he, you know, some of the things, you know, eat, eat plants or eat food, mostly plants, uh, you know, eat real food. You know, I think this sort of runs up against the science that we're talking about here. You know, these are popular ideas. They're easy to digest um, for the public, but there's not a lot of science behind them. I think, you know, I talked about these, you know, well, it's relatively wealthy upper class people who like all natural food. Pollen is the reading material for that crowd. I think. Well, it's also the super poor. 
Hmm. All right. So do you think that there is food that is inflammatory or anti-inflammatory? Hmm. Good question. Yes. What about that? You know, I, I mean, not to use the cliches, but but the dose makes the poison, right? <laughs> right. Um, so I think it depends. You know, I, I've I've seen research where it's it's overeating that causes inflammation. You know, as people gain weight, um, they experience more inflammation, which can uh, increase their risk for for metabolic disease, you know, uh, metabolic syndrome, and so forth. So I, I don't know. I mean, some foods are certainly right, and and is it a good idea to live on cornstarch, right? Obviously, <laughs> obviously not, but I think it's all about balance and it really comes down to quantity, quantity ultimately. And I think it's gonna vary from person to person. You know, if someone's diabetic, they're gonna to talk to their physician and what they need is gonna be a little bit different than what someone like myself needs or, or what any one of you need, you know? Well, that's the reason why some diets work for some people and not others. Yeah. We'll have different metabolisms. Cameron, this is the 40th anniversary of the founding of the Obesity Society. Did you all hear that? Is my mic working? Yep. Yes. yes. Yeah, it is. So I want to make a few points. First of all, that society has about 3,000 members, and they're meeting next week. <laughs> And I'm going to it, and I'm going to it because I was the first president of it 40 years ago. Mm. And I went into the field of obesity because I did not think it would be solved in my lifetime. And so far, that's been utterly, completely true. There has not been a single breakthrough I was having dinner in 1997 with Jeff Friedman, and he told me, I've got this great thing, it's a hormone, and I'm gonna call it leptin. And he said, I said, why? He said, because it's after the Latin word thin. And he said, it's gonna be a great anti-obesity agent. And I said, well, that's interesting, but maybe you shouldn't name it until you get it tried out. <laughs> And he's a good friend, by the way, so I could be blunt with him. It was just the two of us at dinner. And my prediction proved completely true. That is, leptin is not an anti-obesity agent unless you happen to have a very, very rare defect in either the, the leptin receptor or the production of leptin. So no, we haven't solved it. In fact, we don't have a single, not a single agent that's really effective. The newest one out, uh, I think it's Zerpeptide. Let me get it right. Zerpeptide. I'm not even pronouncing it right. You can look that up. Zerpeptide. Anyhow, it was announced on June 3rd at the American Diabetes Association. And it appears, and I emphasize the word appears, it appears that it actually does have a significant and sustaining weight loss effect and without any negative consequences. If that proves to be true, and depending on how long you take it and how much you lose and whether it keeps going, um, it, it's interesting. Obviously, this is the first announcement of the FDA approval of it, June 3rd. And so we've got a long way to go before we know about its real safety and efficacy for different kinds of people. But my, my real point is to emphasize that there is no known solution to obesity. The most effective solution to obesity today is metabolic surgery, as they now call it, gastric bypass, as they used to call it. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. People lose weight. <laughs> Most of them regain it within 10 years, sometimes within two or three years. But it's really the only effective method for getting rid of large amounts of weight. How many saw the weight, weight uh, the, the, the biggest loser, the television program? Yes, of course. <laughs> well, some didn't. It was a program in which people lost a lot of weight 
really a lot, like sometimes 200 pounds, every one of them regained, every one of them. <laughs> so I'm putting the explanation point on what Cameron said. We really don't know. We don't understand the body regulatory mechanisms. <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't have any water here. Uh, we don't understand why some people get fat and some don't on the same diet. Some get fat and some don't on the same exact diet. I did a study of one of those ultra processed foods back about 20 years ago. You will know it as Ensure. E-N-S-U-R-E. E-N-S-U-R-E is the most common diet used for people who must be fed by a liquid diet, a tube in the stomach, or by drinking it either way. It's a fantastic diet. No one develops any deficiencies with it. It does not have any lactose, so they don't get any, any diarrhea, and they can live on it forever, forever, on nothing but that canned liquid diet. So I, I think it's, there can't be anything more processed than a canned liquid diet. <laughs> and uh, especially when you're taking nothing but that canned liquid diet. So I, I guess my point is, we're all wishing there was a magic bullet. We're all wishing there was a, an answer to overeating or under eating for that matter. Um, and God gave us a very, very good regulatory system for body weight. It's different for all of us. I use with my medical students right now, I say, now I want you to sit there and raise your temperature one degree. Okay, couldn't do it, huh? Okay, now don't move. Now lower your temperature one degree <laughs> or two degrees. Food intake regulation is just as good as temperature regulation. It's fantastically positive, strong, effective. It is, the problem is we don't all have the same system. And so people who have a regulatory system around a higher level of fat or a lower level of fat or who are more persuaded by advertisements than by logic and sense, <laughs> You know, can regulate on a whole lot of different things, but we are highly regulated in our food intake. And I'm betting looking at Jack, Tom, Nigel on this uh, video, that none of you do much to control your weight. I'm guessing. I try. I, I actually, I actually uh, was advised by my doctor in 2017 that I had to lose weight. I was up to 205 pounds and, uh, so I started walking every day and working out at the gym. And so I kept my dietary caloric intake the same, but I added more exercise to my routine. So I was burning more calories. So it meant for an overall weight loss. And I'm now I'm fluctuating between 180 and 190. And he said, that's safe. Well, that's a good round. That's just fine. I will tell you this, that exercise without any calorie restriction will be immediately compensated by calorie intake. So you had to have at least been restraining your calorie intake to not I, increase it in response to the exercise. I didn't, um, I didn't have a problem doing, maintaining the diet the way it was. Uh, I mean, I never eat breakfast, so that stayed the same, leaving that out. Um, and I only eat lunch about once every other day. So it's just dinner I focus on. I do my regulating primarily by portion control and finding alternate exercises that uh, don't bother my very bad knees. But I wanna comment on the um, gastric bypass. Uh, you've taken me back in memory to my early years of surgical training, uh, which was general surgery first. And those were days a long, long time ago when they were experimenting with different kinds of uh, bypass procedures. And I remember one vividly uh, when they were putting clips on the distal end of the esophagus and saying, <laughs> well, that, that fixes that. Now let's see them regain the weight. And we had a patient who within a very few months regained all the weight 
simply by melting his ice cream before he took it <laughs> and ate as much ice cream as he could possibly <laughs> put in there. So, so much for um, uh, the problem of regaining weight after all kinds of bypass. By the way, those were the days of uh, total parenteral nutrition. Can you give somebody who is very, very sick for a wide variety of reasons, all they need by uh, intravenous. And the complication to that was diarrhea. And I'm wondering if a straight diet of Ensure might uh, have altered the, uh, the elimination process. I don't know whether it does or not. Well, I think you're right, and it does. I can tell you that. I was at the University of Pennsylvania when the very first parental oh. nutrition feedings were that's done. Where they did it, yes, at Penn. Yes. Yes. yes, and that's where I was at the time yeah. they were doing the initial research on dogs. And I myself have published in the first issue of the Journal of Parental and Enteral Nutrition. Ah, and who was, it was the on, surgeon in charge of that? I can't think of his name. Who was the surgeon on your um, team? Let me think a second. Yeah, I'll, okay. think of it. I'll think about it as soon as we hang up. But yeah. yes, he was there. And um, <laughs> there's no doubt we've made huge improvements on and have an amazing um, ability to make parental nutritions that can save lives. Yeah. And there are people with um, no GI tract or missing major parts of their GI tract who really yeah. need parental nutrition. Mm -hmm. and, and we have shown that it's perfectly possible with very good care mm -hmm. to maintain health with parental nutrition. Parental right. means it's all intravenous. Right. It all has to have a very, it has to have very, very high standards. And you wouldn't want to do that to yourself unless you had no other alternative. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, Dr. Hanson, so the drug we're we... talking about is uh, semaglutide. The, uh, the brand name that was approved by the FDA was called Wagobi. Yeah, no, that's not that's the one not that it. came out in June, but yes. This, this is June 4th part. of, I'm sorry, this is June 4th of last year. Yep. So that's a different one. I think it's terzepatide. Let me see, here it is. T-I-R-Z-E-P-A-T-I-D-E. -E. Terzepatide, that's what I couldn't pronounce. Um, and it was approved by the FDA in June, this June, okay. for the first time. Okay. So that oh. keep an eye on that one. It's going to have to, you know, it's going to have to be more research before we can really uh, recommend it. But it's a good. I mean, it may be a useful adjunct to cutting back calories. But cutting back calories is not simple because we have a good regulatory system, as I tried to make with the yes. temperature analogy. It's a very good one. So Otherwise, we this, we'd all be elephants. <laughs> we, we have this good regulatory system. Why has there been such an increase in ob obesity? Oh, that was an easy one. Good. I was in South, I was in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are no obese people outside the cities. There are obese people when they come into the cities of Cote d'Ivoire and Mali, but not outside the cities. And they are literally on subsistence living. That's the answer to that question. Wow. If they have, if you take the lid off, as we have done in most of the major cities in the world, there's no longer a constraint on food people will then regulate to the ability of their body. That is the preference of their body. And I consider that a regulatory mechanism issue. Yeah, okay. As was American society in 1900, mostly on subsistence feeding. You got that right, exactly. Yeah. So the we, problem have, we have taken that lid off in Sub-Saharan Africa now, and their rate of obesity is going up. And guess what else yeah. is going up? The heights. Oh, working their also. asses off in factories. Type two diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. They go yeah. hand in hand. They go up together, they go down together. And low weight people have very little, if any, type two diabetes. They may lose weight after they get the diabetes, but getting it is not going to happen when they're, uh, when they're on a low calorie diet. Yeah, the people on subsistence diet don't grow. 
properly. So mm -hmm. I, I measured uh, 150 children in Algeria on the edge of the Sahara Desert, and their um, and percentiles were about um, along the fifth percentile of English uh, children. Um, because they were had to poor diet. Yeah, right. George Washington was unusually tall for his age because he grew up in an elitist family. Yeah. By the way, the name you were looking for was Stanley Dudrick. Dudrick, that's it. Stan Dudrick, right? Yep, he was I there when now. I was there. I remember him, and I remember his talks. Uh, at yeah. Good. Were, were you at Penn? No, 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 yeah. no. But I had a lot of friends uh, uh, there. Still do. Well, they uh, they've always been very good in the whole area of appetite regulation, obesity, nutrition. Anyone have anything else? Well, I thank Cameron and I thank all of you uh, for participating and uh, look forward to something on next month. If you guys have any ideas what you'd like to talk about, just give me an email and uh, I'll see if one of our experts <clears throat> is willing to tackle that issue. Um, thank you. Thanks again. Take care. Thank you, Tom. Thank, thank you all. Have a good one. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you, Tom.